Okay. So we're now recording. So welcome, and I am no authority. I let me start by saying I am not a tax expert. I am not a accounting or legal expert in any way. Um, but we're going to do a little talk today about personal service business designations. And this is back on the radar again. I've been talking about this one for like probably ten years, um, and it, it it keeps kind of coming up and down. Um, and the most recent um, thing was um, uh, I, the Chartered Accountants or CPA Association um, did a, uh, a, a press release um, that CRA is going on an audit frenzy from June of this year till December, looking for personal service business uh, designations. So number one, you can find a ton of this on the web, every accounting firm who's ever been and ever will be has written a paper on it at some point. Um, but I'll tell you kind of the history of it. And then we'll talk about how it's relevant. Um, so back in, I think it was 1969. Um, Ralph Sazio was a football player in the CFL with the Hamilton Tie Cats, And Ralph Sazio was a really smart guy. And he said to the Hamilton Tie Cats when they um, hired him, he said, if you want to hire me, Ralph, Sazio is a brand unto itself. I am not just a player. I am a unique, valuable addition to your team. I don't want to be an employee. I'm not anybody's employee. Um, you're buying um, my brand. So you're he, he incorporated and then would bill them for his uh, services of being a football player. So uh, never been heard of before at that point. And it went along fine. Well, pretty soon, <laughs> within a year or two, CRA says, no, 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 no. You cannot be working as a football player and be self-employed and running this incorporated company. And so they took him to tax court and it went on. It was a battle and um, CRA lost. And I don't know if you know this, but when CRA loses, they have a rule internally, which is we will never lose on that one again. So they change all the rules. So by the time it was all finished, it was around 1980 and um, parliament um, brought in a, a tax rule that called that defined a personal service business. So basically before that, we would have said Ralph Sazio was an independent contractor working for the Hamilton Tie Cats, which is obviously a problem because you're not an employee. So why they came up with personal service business designation was you had independent contractors, you could deem an employee, but it was difficult to deem an incorporated company as an, as an employee. It's doable, it's happened in tax court a few times, but it's not easy. So what they did was they said, okay, we're going to come up with this new designation, personal service business designation. It doesn't matter whether you're one person or up to five. If the majority of your income comes from one company and without this incorporation, you would have been employees in the job or the role that you had, then you're deemed a personal service business. And that designation has some things that go along with it. And this all kind of happened um, through the 80s, mostly they kind of cleaned up and they basically said, if you're personal service business, you are no longer allowed to write off any business expenses, except for two things. You're only allowed to write off salaries and salaries actually has like some sub words, like around commissions and things like that. Um, and benefits, funny enough, um, you cannot write off uh, business expenses, office extensions, printing, depreciation, car out, nothing. So you actually lose all your write-offs and you lose a small business um, tax break, which means you go to the highest tax rate in Canada, which somewhere around 43.5%, depending on the province you're in. So this is a bad situation. You don't want to be deemed a personal service business. There's another reason for it. Apart from no write-offs and really high taxes, it's really hard to get out of. The, really, the only way to get out of it is to become an employee and then leave that company's employee at some point, you know, pay taxes while you're an employee, and then start all over from scratch. It's, it's hard to switch back out. You can do it, but it's really hard. So why does this matter? Well, CRA wants their taxes. That's what it comes down to always. And so they don't, they're not happy with all these independent contractors and stuff. And we've seen lots of, um, lots of terminology and rephrasing and, you know, CRA is different than provincial revenue and, is different than WSIB, which is different than EI. Um, but all these things kind of all kind of draw this line of kind of going, everybody wants their, their share of taxes. And so um, 
So now, as I, as I said at the beginning, CRA is going out there auditing, and they've done this a number of times in the past. Uh, maybe 10 or 11 years ago, they went after the oil patch in Alberta and basically so said... In 2006, they hired 76 auditors just for Alberta for this one thing. Yeah. So, yeah. So I was wrong in my timing. Thank you. <laughs> so 15 <laughs> years ago, 16 years ago. Um, and then... Um, then they went after Ottawa and the tech sector um, in Ontario, uh, which at the time, uh, like back around that same time was mainly around Ottawa and then Markham and went after those uh, people as well, trying to kind of figure out who was who and how people were paid. So that's kind of the, the history. So, you know, everyone knows who knows me and has heard me speak. I will not cover independent contractors under um, insurance contracts and employee benefits. It's hundred percent offside. I'll argue with anybody, but the insurance companies gladly accept it. Um, and the insurance companies gladly accept independent contractors that are not employees because you have to agree to a series of statements, which usually say you work only for this company or majority of your time for the company. This is your sole source of income. They control your tools, your time and everything else. Once you've answered all their questions, you're now defined an employee. And by doing that and being on an employee benefit plan, um, you have a problem because all the contracts except for one in Canada all say who's eligible, a full-time employee. There is not full-time employee and independent contractors. Like it, that doesn't exist. I should say that there is one company. Manulife came out um, about seven years ago and said, we're going to change eligibility definitions on group insurance in Canada um, to get up with the changing times. And they said they will now allow the wording in the contract to say full-time employees and also some other categories, which are partners of incorporated companies, partners of partnerships, um, people behind holding companies, independent contractors, and they added all these extra wordings. So we challenged um, Manulife on it and said, based on what grounds and what CRA change was this allowed? And they hemmed and hawed and wouldn't really answer. We asked for a ruling. They finally agreed that they did not have a ruling on it. And um, so finally, I got their their tax, top tax guy. And he got so frustrated with the argument. He said, okay, fine. Here's our attitude. We think we're being forward-looking. And that when CRA reinvestigates the entire industry, they're going to find that Manulife is the one company doing it right and change all the rules to be the way that Manulife is doing it. I would define that as the ultimate in arrogance to think that you somehow have the inside track and, and stuff, and that's never come to fruition. Um, in fact, it's been you know, challenged probably even more so and dividing things up. So, um, so uh, if you never put employees that are independent contractors on the plan, then you're probably okay. If you, uh, and the reason I brought this up again is there was a, a thing going around where advisors were telling clients to take your independent contractors, have them incorporate themselves, and then you're fine. It's just one business building another business. That's so far from true. It's not funny. But there was like a whole pile of advisors giving that advice, which is deadly. And why is it deadly? Well, if an independent contractor was deemed an employee, then... Um, the employer would be responsible for back taxes and withholdings, you know, everything from EI, WSIB, all that kind of stuff. Um, but the employee that they now were would now potentially have to, they'd lose all their write-offs and be reassessed up to seven years backwards. Generally, it seems to be five years. I'm not sure why the difference. Um, but if you were making $100,000 a year and writing off 50000 of it, um, that 50000 times five years would be a quarter million dollar tax bill plus um, penalties plus interest. So you could end up with a half a million dollar tax bill by being reassessed an employee had you been doing this year after year, which lots of companies do. So that's the 10 minute blurb on everything you want to know about PSBs, private, uh, personal service business um, designations. So questions, thoughts, comments, anybody run into it? Jay, you've got experience from, or you just know of it in Alberta? I know a lot of people who got nailed by it. How bad did they get nailed? Well, I don't like, know this. This isn't a setup. I'm just 
it's into the tens of like I've never seen it be less than tens of thousands. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how did they, did, or did they fix it or could they fix it? Like, did they find a way out of it all? I don't know anybody who ever found a way of it all because the story always ends with the cost of the tax bill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then they shut down the business, go bankrupt and start all over again. Right. But well, you know, essentially, you know, CRA said to the person, listen, you know, you look a heck of a lot like an employee, here's your tax bill. And then the employee realizes the problem, the employer realizes the problem, and the person just becomes an employee of the company and closes yeah. down the business. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's because you have a job and you're just trying to be creative. Yeah. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. That won't change. No. And I, I mean, the thing I worry about is advisors creating the problem, not like uncovering it is one thing, but when you tell people and are giving tax advice, that's kind of where I start to get a little bit worried. And I've, I've heard it from too many times. Like when I get up on the pulpit, you know, and say, Hey, don't have independent contractors. I'll have somebody stand up every single time and say, Oh, just tell the client to incorporate. And then it's no problem. You're good to go. I'm like, so wrong. So, so wrong. And, and I try not to slam people in, in seminars because you want the next person to ask a question, but you just go like, do you understand the risk you're putting clients at? And most advisors don't, they just, they just never go that far. Well, they're also putting themselves at risk because they were the ones giving the advice. They're, they're going to get sued when it goes down the road. If the numbers are big enough. Yep. So, and my thing now is it's about 50,000 bucks at least to get to court. So if the loss is greater than 50,000, you're, you know, you got a reason for a lawsuit. If the loss is less than 50,000, not so much. In, uh, unless you're in Ontario and you just, or BC and do small claims court, which is now up to 25,000. 35 out here. 35. Okay. So all of a sudden you, that that's worthwhile. Pay your $200 small court fee and represent yourself. And, and it all of a sudden makes sense going to court because it's not really court. Well, and the other side of this is workers comp doesn't care if you're incorporated, if you're like, they don't care. It's if we think you're an employee, here's your workers comp bill employer. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that gets messy and I'm not going to go down that road because I don't know it well enough. Um, but I mean, yeah, even, even if you have trades people on your property in your, you know, factory or whatever, then the employer is still kind of responsible for them. So it, it creates all sorts of messiness. Well, you know, when you speak about insurers, being fine with bringing on contractors that look this way, you know, over the 20 years I've been doing this, I really believe that, you know, insurers are fine with 10 to 25%, depending on the employer of employees opting out. And, you know, at the end of the day, the insurers have their internal team of lawyers. It doesn't cost them any extra money to go to court. Um, I really believe that, you know, decisions like this are just about the insurer finding more ways to bring in more premium dollars because I don't think yeah. they care. Yeah. And I mean, I've had people argue from the other side saying they're just trying to help. Like, okay, well, that five person independent contractor company mm -hmm. doing all the work, they can put in their own benefit plan. I mean, like they're, there's nothing really stopping people. It's just people want their cake and eat it too. They want to be an employee when it comes to severance and, and benefits. They want to be independent when they get write-offs and everything else. But I know years ago, they in Ontario, they really went after the construction and the trucking industries. Yeah. And I didn't have any clients, but I have, cli I have clients who had friends in those industries, other yeah. colleagues in those industries who got caught yeah. with their pants down and ended up paying WSIB back and CPP and EI and all those going back years. And, and if, unless they were really lucky and all the penalties. Yeah. It seems like if you are willing to fall on bended knee and say, I made a mistake and come clean, no yeah. problem. If they catch you and then you fight it and fight it, they yeah, just keep pushing and pushing. Yeah. 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 And, then, yeah. And, then, and, and then I know that edge benefits used to be really big in the, in that market for independent contractors yeah and all of a sudden well construction sites if you're if it was if it was if it was commercial everybody had had to have wsib whether they were independent or not and that sort yeah. of ended all that market and a lot of people became employees instead of contractors at that point yeah and i'll, I'll defer maybe to blake on this one because i know you do a fair amount of trucking business and stuff but i mean truckers have always been a bit of a problem whether they're contractors or employees and all that kind of stuff 
Yeah, like uh, we're, WSIB in Ontario here has a trucking specific form that you're supposed to fill out and file. If you're going to opt out of WSIB, you have to have that in that trucker's file. And basically, if, if they don't own the truck, they're not going to pass. So the truck has to really be owned by the owner operator. Yeah, you really have to be independent and independent. Yeah. Self employed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can still have all your revenue from one client. So WSIB doesn't seem to care about that, but they need to make sure that you own the tools have a chance for profit and loss and all the other stuff. Yeah. Hey, do you know about peace workers? Is that still allowed? Um, so define what you mean by peace workers. Cause I, I, I was in the manufacturing where you got paid peace work and everything else. And it can mean as something an different as an employee. So back, back in the day when I used to work with my father, let's say plumbing, yeah. uh, they would, they would contract out this house, uh, and then roughins fixtures, you get X amount of money. Yeah. You can have your own incorporation because you were free to work anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, you paid your W, like I would pay my WSIB. Yeah. And as fast as we could cut holes and put in pipe, we got paid for those houses. Yeah. So the general, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. it's just the general rule I would say is, are you doing it for more than one company or only for one company? Are you only doing Green Park Homes? Because that's the part where the triggers, like if you're a freelance and you can do anybody's, then not so much of a problem, right? You've got multiple sources of income, multiple companies, which is a way a lot would start out. And then slowly they'd end up doing all the work for, you know, Monarch Homes or Green Park Homes or, you know, whoever. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you know, it didn't start out offside, but it ended offside. Um, so it, it, you really have to sit down and kind of do the, um, the tests. And like you guys just mentioned, the fourfold test is the, the kind of the definitive one that seems to be referenced most often. And that is uh, um, use of tools, uh, loss risk, gain risk, and control. So if if they told you when you could work, then you you've they're controlling you. If they supplied you with all the tools, your 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 saws, your whatever, then you lose. If um, you finish a job in one day and they say, we're not going to pay you the full amount because we paid you for three, but you did it in one. So you're only going to get a third. Then there's a risk of loss um, gone. So, so everyone goes different. There's an amazing tool. And I don't mean it amazing from the perspective of the answer is key, but the process is key. So Macmillan Law Firm has this test of, are you an employee or are you an independent contractor? And it asks you every question, like there's literally a hundred questions and all, every question is taken from a different piece of legislation. So, you know, there'll be the fourfold test, there'll be a WSIB test, there'll be a EI test and a provincial tax test and all these different things. And as you answer it at the end, it'll tell you, you are most likely going to be deemed independent or an employee or whatever. And I, I tell everybody, it's not the answer you want. It's the process. You want the employer to go through the process to go, here's what they're looking at. Who controls the tools? Who controls the time? What's the profit and loss gain or loss rule? You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's on the CGIB website um, under resources, I think. Actually, let me, I'll find it while we're talking. How far back are they looking at um, all the income coming from one place, right? So sometimes you get a contract job that's going to be one year you're working specifically for this one company uh but the past three years you you know maybe the last year was a different company or, or etc yeah i don't know if there's a clear-cut rule or if it's just um you know if if last year you had five clients and the year before that you had three and this year you have two and next year you have one you know are you likely to be found offside not probably not because it's not an ongoing thing but if you have kind of that same history ongoing with the same company and the same structure that's the problem. Um, it, it's kind of like how people have contract employees. Okay, I'm not talking about independent. I'm talking about contract true employees. If you do the same contract every year and just keep renewing it every year, eventually the courts go, that contract is invalid. You are now a full-time employee. Um, you know, you're trying to avoid severance by having a renewable contract, but unless there's a real defining reason for it, you're just you're just trying to pay, you know, play games and the whole thing. So um but to, to jared's question it also really it's cra opinion and then it's the opinion of the person who's sitting in front of you and sometimes it's the mood of the person who's sitting in front of you who's doing the audit um yeah. so you've got to remind your your clients of that if they kind of look this way just beware 
if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's probably an employee. Um, I just posted that in the chat, that link for the tax assessment tool. And I've given that to a bunch of clients and I've kind of given them a heads up. I'm like, you know, run through, you do your own test. Don't, don't take my word for it. And just here's one that helps you kind of understand kind of the, the, the big key questions from CRA, from Canada Pension, from EI, from all the big, big things. And, um, and it will help you kind of understand the whole thing a little bit better. So that's just defining independent contractor, not a personal service business, but the one follows the other. So, so Dave, what... you, you said it's hard to once you, once you're labeled a PSB to, to be labeled anything else, would yeah. that include even an employee? If you became an employee. So if, if you're deemed a PSB, I'm thinking of if you're, let's say you're in a million bucks a year. Yeah. So in Ontario, you're going to pay 54% or under a PSB, 54%. The yeah. CRA probably doesn't care because that's just the provincial tax difference, not the federal tax difference. Yeah. So would they deem you an employee if you're already a PSB or no? I don't know. Um, I actually had to answer in my head when you started the question and I was changing my mind as I went through. Um, start back at the beginning just for a second again. How did you phrase that in the beginning? Yeah, so if you're earning a million a year, you're going to be paying 54% tax rate in Ontario yeah. or Before 44% that. as a PSB. Do, do they ever change the classification oh. from a PSB to an employee? They wouldn't, you would, you, the employee would. So you would say this is terrible. So, and the, okay. So there's a, a trick question they ask and they go, hold on a minute. Are you saying you're really not an employee? And you go, no, 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 I'm independent. And they go, oh, then you're a personal service business then. And they go, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, sure. I'm not, but I'm not an employee. And then you go, okay, now you're screwed because you just agreed to it. you like, but, um, so if you, if you were coming up to this and then you said, okay, fine, I'm closing down the corporation and I'm going to go and be an employee of that company now, then the problem is solved. Now it doesn't mean they're not going to ask for back taxes and, and withholdings and everything, but I, but I, but that's how you get out of it. You have to go and be an employee to get out of it short of hiring some major accountants to do some major fighting in tax court from what I understand. And I'm just, I'm going by articles from a whole bunch of law firms, big law firms saying like, you don't want to get here because you can't afford to get out of here. Like the price is high, but you know, I, yeah. <laughs> the important thing when thinking about all this is the basic rule that this is under, which is the law of equalization, right? It doesn't matter if you're a corporation or an individual, you should, at the end of the day, end up paying about the same amount of tax. So a corporation isn't on a graded tax scale. So that corporation with a maximum tax rate of 40, 44%, every single dollar is taxed at 44, whereas individually, only your top amount is taxed at that 52 or whatever it is, but your lower amounts might be taxed at 26%. I bet you it would work out about the same at the end of the day. Only probably if you're making about four or 500,000, like at a million, you're paying way like over 50% all in. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. depends on the province. That, that yeah. too, yeah. Um, and I, what's, what's the small business tax exemption? 500,000. So, or tax, ex so yeah, you're 11 and a half percent, I think, up to 500,000, and then it bumps it up to 26. Yeah. It's um, all about math. It is, yeah. And I mean, and really, you know, there, at the end of the day, it may not, well, it always makes a difference, but I mean, the problem I'm trying to resolve here by talking about this, is just making sure that you don't cause the problem. Like somebody else, if the employer caught and the em employee or independent contractor or whatever causes the problem, that's their problem. It's just when you get in there and say, Hey, here's a solution. And it's not a solution. That's, that's the part that, that grabs me. And then, but it's I, more than that. Because, okay, so they're already set up as a contractor, whether it's PSP or however they're set up as a contractor. And if you maybe even carve out and create a contractor class or something, if that audit comes through and they choose to look at the benefit plan, the benefit plan is one more hour in the quiver. The benefit plan is what? Sorry. One I'm more sorry. hour arrow in the quiver. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's like another thing to say, oh, this yeah, person yeah. looks more and more like an employee. So, yeah. so we can, we might not cause the problem, but we can make the problem look worse. Yeah. And we can also solve the problem. And I will tell you, I've had this happen twice now 
uh, once was an, an audit by Revenue Ontario, or is that what it's called? Our provincial one for health tax. So I got a phone call from one of my clients saying, I need your help. We've talked about this before and then something bad is going on. They were being audited for employer health tax, which in Ontario is based on payroll. And this company had about about 100 employees that were employees and about 150 independent contractors that were programmers and computer tech guys that were working inside insurance companies and banks and stuff. So they would send these people into tests and fix and all this kind of stuff. So the auditor came at them and said, hold on, your payroll numbers are two and a half million dollars or whatever, but you're only paying payroll tax on a million of them. And they're like, well, those aren't employees those are independent contractors and they said no 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 those are really employees so that's when they called me and they said we they want us to prove that these people are not employees how do we do that i said that's okay no problem i can help you a little bit just give them a copy of your benefit plan billing and say look we don't these are not employees if they were employees here's our contract for benefits it says full-time employees are eligible they're not on it and here's a copy of the billing to prove they're not on the plan so funny enough, the revenue people were not stupid. They said, we'd like to see the last three years of billings. You could have just dropped them all this month since we brought this whole thing up. So that's not good enough. We want to see the back three years. So we went online, downloaded three years of PDFs and shot them all across. And then they did this really cool test. And the client was so good. He uh, he was an HR person. He called me and he said, um, I don't know what they're getting at. They asked me these really weird questions. And I had to laugh because it just it fit perfect. They asked for four things. They asked for a copy of the internal phone directory that they wanted before the end of the week. They wanted a copy of the cell phone bills, the company's printing bills, and oh my goodness, I can't remember what the fourth one was. And so he's like, what does this have to do with taxes and benefits? I'm like, it's really, really simple. Um, they want your, um, your internal directory because if you have an extension for one of your independent contractors that is on the directory, then you've then provided them tools. You provided them a phone, a desk, and an extension. So that now uses it gets used against you. The reason they want the cell phone bill and the printing bills is to see if you provided them with a cell phone. So they're going to get all the phone numbers that you have for corporate phones. And if one of these independent contractors has it, then it's a tool that the employer provided. Printing, they're looking for business cards. If you gave business cards with your company name and that independent contractor on them, then that shows control and, and all that kind of stuff and tools. Um, so they, they were asking all these questions to kind of further define it. And so he's like, oh, great. Now I know how to answer the questions. I'm like, hey, you're good. You keep it clean. He goes, no, we're not great. We're good, but we're not great. Yes, we don't put them on benefits. No, we don't give them business cards, but we have given a bunch of them cell phones. I'm like, okay, well, you know, it is what it is, you know, but um, in the end, there was enough stuff between the benefit plan and all the other stuff that they went, okay, you're, we, we're not going to deem them employees, you don't have to play employer health tax or anything else. So client was very happy that we could help them out and steer them away from trouble. Unusual, but but happens. The other one was a smaller version, very similar. And it was a different audit. I can't remember. It wasn't provincial health tax. It was something else, but went through the same kind of process, but it went away faster. Uh, they just showed them that they weren't on the plan and, and that was all that they needed to do. So we can help or we can hurt. I'd rather help. What about owners um, that have their own um, holding companies? Is that a problem at all? So what, what, Okay, so, um, so let's say there's multiple owners or shareholders and they have their own holding company for tax purposes. So I had one group and they actually set up a contractor's class for them because their income would um, fluctuate so much. So they had to be like a flat amount of life insurance. And, yeah. And, so, and those, yeah. So if, if it's with anybody but Manulife, then it would technically be offside because they're not full-time employees of the company. Now, so that's a quick answer. If you said all these holding companies were subsidiaries of this company and they all had a controlling interest, no problem, but they never do. Okay. Because you have your holding company that's all yours and they have theirs that's all theirs and he has his and she has hers, but you don't own 50% of each other's holding company. Otherwise, why would you do it in the first place? So generally you would fail the test and the shareholders behind holding companies would not be eligible to be on plans, period. 
Let me give you an example. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Wait a minute, Rina, are you asking about shareholders? Or are you talking about owners who are active in the company? Who owners that are been, active in the company. Yeah, who have been, so they've, they've got an associated company. It's not, it's not really a hold co, it's an op co that charges management fees over to the uh, other operating company. Which doesn't make and you an employee. owns the other company. Which does not make you an employee. No, but and there is no such um, thing as hold codes and op codes, right? Like we we use that phrase, but they have no standing, right? Like, well, an op code usually has passive investments, whereas a hold co, yeah, you're right there. But yeah, um, yeah. But, but, but I but I but I have companies with three shareholders, two of whom collect salary, and they're on the benefit plan, and the one that only collects dividends. They collect salary plus dividends. And the one that only collects dividends is not on because he's not an active employee. Correct. That's the right way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. But, you but if they own it, it's for... the active employee, right? Like if they own, they're working for the company, they're, they have, let's say they have a T4 salary, and but they also draw dividends. So they have a yeah, as, as long as they, of... they have to get a T4 salary to be an active employee. And the T4 salary has to come from the company that they're working for, not the holding company. That's right. Does it matter the amount of the T4 salary? No, uh, there's kind of a reasonableness test. Like you can't do $1. Um, it seems like 25,000 is the low number that people use. And I, even my accountant said that when we were having a talk about this one day, he was just make them draw a minimum 25,000 or something. But, I, but, I have, but I have a lot of accountants who tell them they should draw, uh, they should draw the YMPE. Talking about like sixty thousand dollars, right? Yeah. So like yeah. dollars. That's just the max out your pension. I do that myself in mine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You then can you get around. Because then you max out the CPP at the same time. Yeah. There's less as questions. Long, it's not not. It's not a normal an salary. It's a real salary. Yeah. As long as you have an email from the company accepting it, they'll do it. Because I do a lot. I, I have a lot of shareholders that, and I don't understand why they don't pull like the minimum T four. As long as Sun Life, Manulife, Candlelight understands that these are active employees within it, they can overwrite the contract. I do it all the time and they acknowledge it. Oh, because they're not taking any risk. The client is. Right. Yeah. Right. But no, if they want benefits, as long as you get an acknowledgement from the company stating it is okay, we understand they are an active employee, but taking out dividends for tax purposes. They will cover them as long yes. as you get that. No, CRA won't hold it up. There's only one tax case in all of Canada, Canadian history. It's only in Quebec tax. It's only in French, um, where you could be deemed an employee without drawing an income. And dividends are investment income. They are not work or effort income. So if you are not drawing a, a salary from the company or some form of T Ford income, then mm -hmm. you're not an employee. And so I actually had an accountant challenge me on this because I did an article about it and he was from Montreal and he said, you're full of shit. Like, I don't know why you're getting off talk. And with like, and Hey, I've been told I'm full of shit lots of times over the years, but he, uh, he said like, no, you're making this wrong assumption that you have to draw income to be an employee. And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, going, so how's that wrong? And he said, well, what about interns that don't get paid? Do they not get deemed to be employees? I'm like, no, they don't actually. Like, I mean, that, that, that in itself is a problem because they're not <laughs> protected, right? Yeah, you can't do it anymore. And they've tightened up on that whole area. But um, if you're not drawing an income, so he goes, no, I'll prove to you that the courts have deemed somebody not drawing an income and they can still be an employee. And I go, give me an example. And they go, well, what happens if your company had a really bad year and the employer just decided not to draw income from that year? I'm like, okay, yeah, that could happen. But is there a track history of, employment income and they're like well yeah but just this one year i'm like well then like all we're doing is just saying okay yeah we got a bad year where the guy took a lower income down to zero but that's not going to jeopardize like the, the historical structure of things but it's when it's set up that way that it becomes a problem or is kept going that way the insurance companies don't care about the client like at all right they're it, their shareholders are who they report to so there are so many things that they do offside. Um, it's not funny. And they make up new rules all the time to accept it. I'll, I'll give you one other example that's kind of tax related. Every province um, regulates health care. So we have the uh, medical professions um, chart that CRA does, and it goes by province what's eligible. 
And so massage, for example, massage therapy is only registered and controlled in Ontario, BC, and Alberta, maybe, or Quebec, maybe. There's like four provinces, I think. So in all the other provinces, that's not an eligible um, expense for CRA. So if you had somebody who was in Saskatchewan, an employee, and you're paying for their massage on your benefit plan, traditional insured, HSA, doesn't matter. That's not eligible according to CRA. You cannot put it against your medical expense tax uh, credit, and you cannot put it against your plan. So the problem is back in the day, the insurance companies could not deal with province of claim, province of residence, province of um, purchase of goods and all that kind of stuff because the systems were so antiquated. So the insurance companies went to the CLHI, they all sat down at the table together and they said, let's come up with a, a letter of understanding that says we're going to treat every province the same and we're going to pretend like they're all covered and eligible. And they've held on to that letter for the past 20 years, all saying we're all going to break the law together and that way we have a better likelihood of holding up. I got a copy of that letter. Um, the guys at my HSA have it. It's on the C CGIB website. Um, and they basically kind of all agreed to break the law together. So they do this all the time. It Whatever makes them money, whatever creates premium, they're trying to be helpful. And if you ask them, they're responding to us who is saying, hey, I want to take care of this owner. And if if you take it away from what we deal with every day and think of it more in the maybe the literal abstract with such a thing. I own Bell Canada shares. So Dave Patriarch, as an individual, I invested in Bell Canada when I was like six years old. My, my grandmother gave me shares. So um, those shares grow along every year. At which point do I get to go on to the Bell Canada benefit plan? Never. I'm just a shareholder. It would, it would be ridiculous for me to be on the employee benefit plan as a shareholder. Nobody would question that in a second. Like they go, of course, you can't go on the benefit plan. You're not an employee. And yet somehow when it goes from being a Bell Canada Enterprises to being, you know, Tom's construction company, all of a sudden the idea of a shareholder changes somehow. And it, it's not. You're, you're either paid for your work effort, you're an employee, or you're paid for your investment effort and you're a shareholder getting dividends. So, so back to Arena's original question, in which she has an active owner who is charging the company that he or she owns. Um, you know, the, so yeah, you're right. There's all these other issues there, but at the end of the day, uh, the business owner wants benefits, wants to be on the benefit plan, bringing the accountant. What I've done in the past, where I've got everybody saying, "Yeah, here are the concerns." Yeah. Accountant's not worried. Business owner's not worried. We've just associated the company and created a division and reported to the insurance company. Here's how the person is associated. We typically don't do disability insurance. And we'll typically do an individual standalone disability insurance. That way we're not have to be worried about uh, salaries or any of the above. And then everything is documented. So what's the rule for adding a subsidiary sister company, mother company or whatever to a plan? Ownership. Right. So as long as you have a situation where there's a controlling interest, every company is a little bit different, but 50% tends to be the rule. They'll go along with it. The problem is that's not the way it works out most time. So you got three or four partners. Um, they all have hold codes that are all one third owners of the other. You can't do it. It's offside. So theoretically, if you had two equal partners, that would be the most you could ever have to be deemed as um, cross, but they don't have a common ownership. So the, the other company does. So adding those companies is a problem. Unless and then in those cases where you've got more than two, you screwed. do you say, hey, listen, pull. $25,000 a year in salary off your major company and then do the rest over to your that, management. That's the answer. Yeah. yeah. And and like whether you're doing it for Richard's reasons of, I don't know, I'm going to put words in Richard's mouth for a second because just because you brought it up. Before. No, yeah. But like whether you're doing it to have income for a Canada pension or whether you're doing it so that you have an income so that you can get a mortgage tomorrow or whether you have an income, like there, there's a whole lot of reasons to draw a true income versus self-employment income or a, like running behind a corporation. Um, like, so just being an employee as well opens the door to everything and, and keeps everything on side. So if Richard draws $250,000 from his uh, company and says, I'm going to take 65,000 as my salary and the rest as, you know, dividends or bonuses or whatever, great, you know, not a problem because he's still an employee of the company. It's weird, eh? Like, I mean, it, it's, it's 
to me, when I figured it all out years ago, like, I mean, we're going back 20 years ago when I started asking questions and I'm like, wait a minute, show me where in the tax act or where in CRA rulings, you can do this. And the insurance company says, well, we're just doing what the advisors ask for. I'm like, yeah, but it's offside. And they're like, it's not our problem. It's up to them to know. It's up to the client and their accountant, you know, to get their own advice and everything else. And all those first handouts from, um, from the insurance companies that said, in order to be an independent contractor, this is what you need to do. They were like, they were screwed. Like, I mean, they, if you agree to the terms, you were actually agreeing that you were an employee, like it's, and, and that, that's not a good thing. I'm, I'm just, I think I've got one. I just was going to show you because it's, um, it's probably the best, the best worst one ever. Uh, bear with me one second. Great West Life. Great West Life. Well, you look that up, Dave. I'll yep. just say like the issue with dividends goes back kind of pre-2015 when it used to be way more tax advantage to pay yourself in dividends. And Trudeau and Morneau got rid of that. So now like if someone's still doing that, there's no real benefit. So you can just throw on a $50,000 salary. You're in the same place tax-wise and away you go. No, the benefit is to the account. The account says, well, I can save you 10% if we do dividends because you're not doing CPP. That's, that's the only remaining benefit. But really, accounts are trying to save you money last year where, you know, CPP is all about retirement. So, yeah, so it's a little bit of a... Yeah. Um, I can't believe this happened. I have the document. I found it. And I can't open it because it's in an old style document. I don't have the apps for it anymore. Um, does anybody have a definition of what you need to be on a plan if you're an independent contractor? Like, has anyone got that handout from an insurance company in recent yeah. years or even in the past? Yeah. But, but they're all a bit different though, Dave. Are you saying just in generality? They all, they all had the same like four or five things in them. Um, but then some added more and some added less. Um, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to find it easy. Oh, actually, maybe. No. No. But it, but anyway, what what the the question? Every questionnaire I've ever seen from the insurance company saying we'll allow these people as long as they agree to this this checklist. That checklist was defining them as an employee. So by agreeing to the checklist, you agreed you were an employee, and just posing as an independent contractor, which puts you offside legally offside actually because you're entering into a contract even as an employee in a various kind of way but yeah any other thoughts questions Irina you got that look on your face that says I have more <laughs> no I was just looking for that independent contractor list I thought that Great West Life I know Great West Life used to have it for sure because I used to work there and yeah. we were given that it um, was that green sheet like it was a one pager yeah and had 10 bullet points on it yeah and, I'm yeah. just trying to look for it but I can't find it either oh actually I might have it um um I don't know if, here we go again um my plan administrator checklist um course that we used to do back in 2000 had it in it wait 2000 22 years ago no so Chantel, 15 years ago yeah go ahead i'm, I'm just reading your e your email here uh, your tech your chat message so if you thought about have you thought about doing something like manual life's guaranteed to issue independent benefit package there's no law there's no life insurance but there is health and dental no medical underwriting. There's a couple of those kind of single standalone. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, one one lawyer. So how do you carve that one person out of a, of a group plan that refuses to make this guy an employee or to you know take him off the plan? And I've given them everything's in writing. They've acknowledged. They said, yeah, we still want him on the way it is. And I said, well, if there's ever you know a really serious you know health claim or a you know travel claim. He may not be covered, even though the carrier is allowing him to be on the plan. We've written it in the contract. He's still not meeting the definition. Yeah, because they avoided the contract by putting him on the plan. 
yeah. when they know there's not a plan. I change their minds. I don't want to walk away from the group. And I've had them, you know, for many, many years. And I just, it's, it's literally, you know, waiting to happen with a law firm. But so I will tell you something that you're not going to like <laughs> every <laughs> almost, you know, well, yes, but no, every single, almost every single problem that I've had that's been a lawsuit that I've been involved in has been lawyers uh -huh. working for law firms when things go wrong. It's usually disability, um, 90% of the time, probably, but and you don't, but, and you don't sure yeah, there's no disability. It's just, he's got a small amount of life insurance. It's not a big deal, but it's more of the, the health and the travel part. That would be my only. And yeah. of course, there's CI again. It's a small amount, but it's but, that, but, that, but there are there are some independent products like that. Yeah, lots. That 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 you could carve carve out for the one contractor, um, okay. and theoretically, the contractor should pay for it themselves. Right. Um, I could bring there's it ways up. Of, there's ways of account. Uh, so there's, there's ways accountants have of transferring the money back over to the employee or whatever percentages they'd be paid for. But that, but that's the cleanest way to do it. Because I have a couple of independent contractors that are like, you know, they were the second employee hired after the owner. Yeah. Um, that's usually what it ends up being. It's like, you know, and they end up, for some reason, they've decided they got to stay an independent contractor. They refuse to become an employee. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, and that's usually the situation. And, and I've gotten other coverage but it's, yeah. So the real so, problem is if you ever go to move that group, you're in you're in deep shit. Yes, yeah. So Pam just posted from Ram. So what do you? It's in the the chat there. So yeah. number one, the contract employee must work 100 for this um for this yeah. employer, not for this company, for this employer. Yeah. So I'm assuming she cut and pasted this and didn't change it. So right away, you just defined yourself as an employee, just with the first one alone, period, done. Number two, the contract employee has to be hired for at least six months for or uh, for a specific project. That's fine. They uh, must have acceptable type of occupation. I don't know what that is. I guess you can't be a dynamite hauler. Um, you have to pay 50% of the premium. Well, that's standard anyway. Um, oh, there you go, uh, Richard. Um, you yeah. cannot be a private contractor who works on a job or place or piece okay. of work business basis, piece work business. Yeah. yeah. Um, and an employer employee relationship must exist. So what did you just define an employee? They're not independent. You just, if you, sorry, I'm not, I'm attacking you, Pam, just, I know you're listening and not speaking, but I mean, if you put an independent contractor with Ram, you just define them as an employee. You just screwed your client and the employee because you just got them to agree that they were an employee how does that help anybody right um and the last phrase that they put in here is kind of wrong if these guidelines are met then we could set up a contract employee class so it's not wrong it's just it doesn't address it they're not independent contractors they are contract employees which means they work full time for the company and they are a true employee which means all source deductions so this isn't really even an independent contractor this is just saying we're going to make the person a full time contract employee well you know that's that's actually really good helpful wording at the end if they've actually written that because a lot of the insurance contracts state permanent employee, right? Like the intention is supposed to be permanent and you hire somebody on a one-year contract or a maternity contract and you want to give them benefits, yeah. they're offside. Yeah, 100%. I like that one. They're actually trying to help the advisor. Help her. <laughs> Double-edged sword. Um, the permanent thing's always been an issue. It's come up in court a few times where um, I had one lawyer I was working with on a case and he's like, right. define permanent. And like, does that mean you have to work for the company till you're age 65 or like, or, or whatever? No, 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 no. but it, you know, like it, it, it's about the intention. When you hire somebody, you give them the contract, you know, of, of high of employment, it's going to be, you know, we're going to start you at $50,000 a year and this is your job. But some yeah. of those say for the period of nine months. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with contract employees. You do all source deductions, set up a separate class, no LTD, flat life, all that kind of stuff. Well, Flat life may not even be necessary. You can do you can do uh, LTD contract employee. There's no issue there. They're an employee. No, 
no, no, no, no, no, no, no, no, because the LTD could go could go on longer than the contract for the employee in the first yeah. place. And by virtue of being a contract employee, you have a way to extend your contract, which is disability. So I've never met an insurance company that would cover a contract employee be, with for disability. They'll cover everything else because it is like, yeah, what Heather said, it either goes beyond the contract or the expectation of employment. Um, what I have had happen, and I'm going back 20 years now, was I had a company say, sure, we'll offer LTD benefits to your contract employees, um, but it will have a flat uh, two-year benefit period, and that's it. So everybody else gets to age 65, but we're never going to pay more than two years, um, period, period, period. And their contracts were all one year, so that wasn't a, a huge stretch. But but right away, it makes you go, well, hold on a minute. What are we really buying, right? So the the, the words yeah, that they hand out... Sense as you say it, yeah. Yeah, the words that they hand out, the insurers or TPAs for eligibility, you have to read them and kind of go, what are, what am I getting my client to agree to? And basically what you're doing is you're getting the client to say, these people are true employees, they're not independent anymore. Whether they're incorporated or not, doesn't matter. Um, they're defining contract, which is fine because you can put contract employees in their own class. Like I said, no LTD and stuff like that generally. I'm not going to say nobody will do LTD because there may be. There's some interesting but, stuff out there. But but the reality is, I suspect everybody sitting around this screen has known of a contract, a, a maternity leave contract or a sick leave contract employee who ended up becoming permanent because a permanent employee of the company, because either the person they were replacing never came back or they, they expanded the job or whatever. They expanded yeah. the job. Yeah. So that's okay, as long as yeah. you don't put the person on the plan until they became a full-time employee, right? Yeah. 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 And anybody with good HR practices will update the contract on that day that, we, that yeah. they get extended. If you have HR. Yeah. Anything else people want to hit on on PSBs? I mean, uh, we kind of skewed a little bit with independent contractors and subcontractors, and now we have a new class that they're working on called, is it captive contractors or not captive? Um, bolt, bolt, um, that they mean CRA is working on? Yeah. Like there's this other definition that they're working on when somebody is a, um, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like it's. Well, th this is Uber pushing it, right? To be like a, a dependent contractor, but a not at all the ESA rights. It. Yeah. So you're a dependent contractor, which means you're only doing income from one company, but you don't have the rights of an employee, but you do kind of, but not really. And they're trying to build this other class. Um, yeah. So I, sorry, it is, it's, it's Uber and those kind of companies that are pushing it. It's not CRA pushing it. They're just trying to figure a definition to make it all work. Yeah. And they're going province by province because most employment standard acts are all provincial. Very, very few of those are going to be fed, federally regulated, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, the only federally regulated messy area is really probably trucking. Like, I mean, airlines and power companies and stuff like that don't get into all these issues. Trucking does. Yeah, I imagine media must have a whole bunch of independent question marks, too. That's true, yeah. That's a good one, yeah. So speaking of all this, is, have you ever heard of the case Maxwell versus Maxwell? Give me a refresh and I'll tell you yes or no. So this is a guy who I think was from the 70s or the 80s. He owned a manufacturing company and got injured by one of his machines. So the employee, Maxwell, sued the owner, Maxwell, the same person. And he came to a settlement of like 120 grand. So of course, in a settlement, you don't pay income tax on. So he got the 120 grand and the business took the full deduction. And it was in the States and the IRS said, no, you can't do that. And so they took the IRS to court and he won. So he was allowed to get the full deduction and tax free. It's all about how good your lawyer is, right? <laughs> There's some weird ones. Um, anything else people want to add, discuss? Argue? So the bottom line is incorporating doesn't get you around the independent contract rules. As a matter of fact, it causes more problems in the long run. It, it gives you a false sense of security is what I would yeah. say. Like people kind of think if you're incorporated, you're okay. And don't, don't get me wrong. There is um, like, there's nothing wrong with independent contractors. Like, so if I have an office and I have a cleaning service that comes in, you know, once a week to empty the garbage can, cans and vacuum and stuff, 
that's an independent contractor. There's nothing wrong with that. But I would never put that person on my benefit plan. And there's tons of bookkeepers like that. Bookkeepers, even HR resources that you, HR resources. you know, HR people. I, I even know of, of CFOs for hire. Yeah, yeah. There actually used to be a company called the Part Time Controller. Yeah. Um, that was uh, out of I think Markham La for years. La yeah. Larry Larry Cooper. Yeah. Called. Yeah, Richard. Uh, I think Richard Singer was one. Um, yeah, there's there's yeah. two or three guys over the years yeah. that have done it, and um, and I mean that that's fine. It they're they're independent contractors. They bill for their time. They come in, do a job. They disappear again until you call them again. No problem. And it's, some of them even, some of them come in one day a week or one, two days a yep. month. Yeah. But they're I, regular, regular employees and yeah, they have to, lots of clients. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's the other thing. Right. So the, the, I use the office cleaner because everybody gets office cleaners. Yeah. So they have 50 clients and you know, they're out different places every night. They're at a bank first and they come to your place and they go to the office down the street, you know, or whatever. Um, and that's just like a really clear, easily understandable, good, no messy independent contract. Now, 